Hi, this is Dr. Rudresh. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Medical Microbiology Guide. Please subscribe and press the bell button for more videos. In this session, we will study the genus Giardia. The parasite belonging to genus Giardia inhabit the intestinal tract of vertebrates. There are various Giardia species which affect the various animals including the human beings. Giardia intestinalis which is also called as Giardia lamblia or Giardia duodenalis infect the human and some of the rodents. Giardia muris infect the mammals. Giardia agilis infect the amphibians. Giardia sitaki infect the birds. Giardia aridae infect the rodents. Now let's consider the Giardia lamblia which is a important human pathogen worldwide. Giardia lamblia is also known as Giardia intestinalis or Giardia duodenalis. The Giardia lamblia was first observed by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek through his a handheld microscope. He observed the parasite in his own stool specimen and he wrote the diagram of it. But till 1859 when the William Lamble identified the parasite it was not established as a pathogen causing the diarrhea. So hence the name of the parasite goes with the inventor Lamble. So Giardia Lamblia. We can do the systematic classification of Giardia and place it under the kingdom Protista, subkingdom Protozoa, phylum Sarcomastigophora, class Kinotoplastida, order Diplomonadidae. The Giardia lamblia can be genotyped into two types based on the, the place of origin. The genotype A1 and A2 is of Polish origin and genotype B is of Belgium origin. This is only of epidemiological importance because genotypes are not associated with any virulence or any particular uh, type of predilection for a population. The parasite inhabits the small intestine of man. So most commonly duodenum followed by jejunum and upper ileum. It has two morphological forms that is trophozoites and cyst. Trophozoite is a pear shaped disc or a teardrop shaped structure with a broad rounded anterior end and a tapering posterior end. So you can see this is a broad anterior end and a tapering posterior end. The parasite measures 10 to 20 micrometers in length and 5 to 15 micrometers in breadth. The dorsal surface, if you see the parasite from the lateral angle, okay, so the dorsal surface is convex while the ventral surface is concave, hence it appears in sickle shape in the lateral view. The ventral surface is occupied by a bilobed adhesive disc. So through this disc the parasite is going to attach to the intestinal mucosa. The parasite is bilaterally symmetrical with two median bodies, two axonemes and four pair of flagella. It has two nuclei with central karyosome giving a characteristic face like appearance to the parasite. At two axostyles they run diagonally across the cytoplasm and the presence of this four pairs of flagella will give a characteristic falling leaf motility to the parasite. Now let's see how to write the diagram of the trophozoite of Giardia lamblia.
cyst is the infective stage of the parasite this is oval or ellipsoidal in shape measuring 8 to 12 micrometers in length and 7 to 10 micrometers in breadth the thick cyst wall which surrounds the cyst will give a, a clear uh, halo like uh, structure when we do the permanent staining of the cyst cyst consists of a finely granular cytoplasm which is separated from the cyst wall by a clear space cyst consists of four nuclei which remain in pair on either side of the axostyle and median bodies when we do the iodine mount of the the cyst the cyst appears as brown in color <coughs> now let's see the life cycle life cycle is simple and it is completed in one host the cysts which are passed in the stool of the infected individual will get mixed with the food and water when this contaminated food and water is ingested by and another healthy individual the cyst will reach the stomach once the cyst reaches the stomach the existation of the the cyst will occur so each cyst will give rise to two trophozoite and these trophozoites will reach the duodenum and jejunum where they multiply by binary fusion and they adhere to the enterocytes through ventral suckers as the trophozoite pass down the intestine some of them they converted get converted into the cystic form so this is called as encystation so this encystation encysted uh, trophozoite it contains four nuclei and this is released in the form stool there are various virulence factors which potentiate the pathogenicity of the giardia the one such virulence factor is cystin rich surface protein which is called as crp136 this is a potential toxin but its function is not yet fully known and when the giardia lamblia attaches to the jejunal wall it increases the uptake of the antigen from the intestine this increases the hypersensitivity and allergic responses to the antigen which is absorbed and also the attachment of the parasite to the intestine it delays the recruitment of the mast cells from the tissue thereby escaping from the 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 deleterious effect of the macrophages and also the attachment of the parasite to the intestine decreases the reabsorption of the or there will be a malabsorption of the levothyroxine thereby leading to hypothyroidism so this concept of hypothyroidism due to the giardia infection has been proven because if you treat the person with the metronidazole the person will come back to euthyroid status the surface antigenic variation is one of the important virulence factor which help the parasite to escape from the immune uh, responses the variant specific surface protein help the parasite to resist the proteases which are there in the stomach and intestine so this will create an uh, enhanced survival in the the gastric as well as the intestinal environment and also some of the immunodeficiency disorders like uh, common variable hypogammaglobulinemia they are associated with the repeated giardia infection uh, uh, explaining the the importance of the gamma globulins in preventing the the giardiasis whereas patients with hiv and patients who are on chemotherapy or on steroids they don't have uh, or they don't suffer from repeated giardiasis now let's see the pathogenesis and pathology in brief trophozoites will come and attach to the mucosal epithelial cells 
of the duodenum and jejunum and once they attach because of the mechanical coating of the intestine and also damage to the the microvillary structures of the mucosal cell lead to the malabsorption of the the vitamins as well as the proteins so the spectrum of the disease produced by giardia is known as giardiasis and giardiasis leads to chronic diarrhea and malabsorption of the fat carbohydrates and proteins the mechanism of diarrhea is due to the coating of the intestinal mucosa by large number of the trophozoite and also due to the damage to the epithelial brush border of the intestinal mucosa or alteration in the gut motility or increased secretion of the fluid into lumen can lead to the diarrhea the incubation period of a giardia infection varies from 1 week to around 21 days that is 1 week to 3 weeks and majority of the infections they go unnoticed or they remain asymptomatic and most commonly in the endemic areas the children are the one who are most commonly affected around 40 to 80% are children they suffer from acute giardia infection or chronic giardia infection acute infections are associated with watery diarrhea abdominal cramps bloating and flatulence so an acute episode may last up to 5 to 7 days and it can resolve on its own or it can go for a chronic stage the chronic giardiasis is associated with chronic diarrhea with malabsorption of the fat vitamin a proteins and carbohydrates there will be weight loss malaise nausea and anorexia and when there is a chronic giardiasis the complications of the chronic giardiasis are the growth retardation and weight loss there can be a delayed milestones in the younger children reservoir of infection is man but the dog beavers and other animals act as a possible reservoirs for this parasite the contaminated water is the source of infection and the fecal oral route is the mode of transmission of the parasite this is the most common mode rarely the homosexual that is the uh, oral anal sex will uh, transmit the infection from one person to another person the infective dose can be as low as 10 cyst can uh, start the disease now we'll see the laboratory diagnosis so we can do the parasitic diagnosis or we can detect the antigens of the parasite in the stool or we can go for serological diagnosis or molecular diagnosis now let's see one by one parasitic diagnosis here we can collect stool duodenal aspirate duodenal or jejunal biopsy for demonstration of the parasite we can do the stool microscopy to demonstrate the cyst and trophozoites generally cyst can be demonstrated in the formed or soft soft stool whereas trophozoites can be demonstrated in the fresh watery diarrheal stools so we can do we have to do the direct pregnant examination using uh, saline to demonstrate the motility of the trophozoites iodine mount can be uh, done to demonstrate both the trophozoite as well as cyst one important aspect to be remembered is we may have to take more than 3 sample that is up to 5 to 6 sample may be required to demonstrate the parasite this is because the trophozoites can be adherent to the intestinal epithelial cells and they are not frequently released and hence the uh, we have to get up to 5 to 6 sample to uh, diagnose the the giardia infection we can 
stain the stool specimen using the permanent stains like trichrome stain or iron hematoxylate stain and we can demonstrate both the cyst and trophocyte. Generally, trophocytes are much better appreciated in the permanent stain smears. An examination after the stool concentration like uh, formalin ether acetate concentration technique or zinc sulfate concentration techniques uh, can be used whenever we suspect a very low level of parasites in the stool. The copro antigen test or stool antigen test uh, for detecting the GIDA antigen in the stool, we can do either ELISA or immuno, direct immunofluorescence test to detect the antigens of the GIDA in the stool. So this is a useful test for screening purpose and also this is used to uh, identify the cases during the epidemics. There is a uh, recent immunochromatographic card test which is available for detection of antigens of GIDA, Entamoeba histolytica and the Cryptosporidium species. So this is nowadays more commonly used in the field settings because it can diagnose the condition within 10 minutes. So other modality of demonstrating the uh, parasite is the duodenal content examination. Here we have to take the duodenal fluid where the, the parasitic load will be high. So to take the duodenal uh, fluid we can do a test called as the string test. The string test is also known as entro test. This entro test has a gelatin capsule which contains the nylon string with a weight attached to the attached to it. So we, we have to advise the patient to ingest the capsule and attach one end of the, the string uh, to the cheek of the, the person and allow it to remain for 4 to 6 hours. So the gelatin will be taken out and the string will move up to the duodenum. Now, we, if we pull back the thread and the squeeze out the, the material, we will get the duodenal samples, so which should be examined for the trophozoids and also we can do the permanent staining techniques as explained previously. We can take the duodenal biopsy or aspiration using the endoscopic technique and also we can obtain the samples using the Kevis capsule or the Robin's tube. The specimen should be subjected for microscopy. So it can be either done for demonstration of the parasite directly or we can do the histopathological examination which may reveal some of the non-specific findings which uh, will not lead us to the diagnosis but it helps in uh, confirming the diagnosis whenever so there is a suspicion without any parasitic forms in the, the other modes of diagnosis. The, the duodenal sampling is the most sensitive method and it can also be uh, used to detect the other intestinal parasites. Serodiagnosis, the GRDA is not going to cause any invasive disease. Hence, the antibodies are produced. Uh, uh, very minimally or sometimes no antibodies can be found against GIDA but if uh, uh, there is a, a severe infection we can demonstrate the antibodies against the GIDA using indirect immunofluorescence or ELISA test. We can do the DNA probes and PCR for the diagnosis of the GIDA from the stool specimen. Treatment includes the uh, using the nitroimidazole derivatives like metronidazole or tinidazole. We can use the quinacrine which is nothing but an acridine dye or we can use the furazolidone which is a nitrofuron. So all these drugs can be used in the, the non-pregnant group whereas in pregnancy we can use the 
paramomycin. Paramomycin, though it is less effective against giardia, but still, it, uh, considering the safety in pregnancy, we have to use it in pregnancy. The preventive aspects include the hand hygiene, boiling water before use, drinking the filter water, chlorination of the water, improved water supply, proper disposal of the human faces and health education. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe and press the bell button for more videos.